It's a great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, one of our former alumni here, uh, Dr. Dr. Karen Crow. She was a student back in the mid '90s with uh, under Ralph Larson and Greg Kaye. And prior to that, she went to Cal State Northridge, did her bachelor's degree, and then she went off into teaching for a few years, junior high school. And as someone who taught junior high school myself for a few years, you want to like shoot yourself after a couple of years of doing that. It's the worst thing to do. I, I, I felt that you shouldn't be any, be over, over 30 and doing junior high because you have to be really quick on your feet. So I have a lot of respect for that alone. Um, Karen, after she finished here, went on to uh, do her PhD with uh, Giacomo Bernardi at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. And after that, did a uh, postdoctorate at uh, Yale University of all places. It's kind of snooty, it seems to me, but <laughs> I, I will all I want. <laughs> um, so, and um, anyway, along the way, she also works as an interpretive ranger at uh, Channel Islands, nice place. And you worked as a teacher curriculum specialist at Cal State Long Beach. And you're also a research technician at Hopkins? That's true. Cool. That's good to know. I didn't, I didn't even know that. I, was, I didn't even know this. I learned something every day. Um, anyway, her research involves working with uh, uh, molecules, DNA, looking at evolution in fishes, reproductive novelties, and had the pleasure of last uh, couple years working with her, with one of her undergraduates, Kelsey Chiquillo, on a uh, paper looking at uh, the mermaid's purse, a uh, uh, project looking at the uh, Bar uh, big skate, Bering Raja binoculata. And in the course of that paper, we uh, uh, resurrected a new tribe of skates, which is a really cool project. And hopefully, we'll be able to have some, uh, hopefully, some more collaborations along those lines as well. And uh, very excited about that. I also, for a talk today, I wasn't quite sure what we're talking about. I, we have two talks. I guess we're going to be here for a couple hours. I'm glad they made a lot of food today. We're going to also be hearing about the evolution of novelty in fishes. And we're going to have a Fed talk. But if you haven't caught the Fed, that's a new one. It kind of took over for Ted. Fish evolution and development. <laughs> so I'll be looking forward to that <laughs> today. She just she's a real iron woman. Wants to go for it. So uh, every saddle in. It's going to be a be a long long afternoon evening. Uh, but it'll be exciting the whole time. So um, anyway, Karen, I'm very happy to introduce you today, and I'm looking forward to your talk. And um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much. for that introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to uh, be back at Moss Landing um, where I did my master's degree. And I promise that this talk will take a small fraction of the length it will take you to take your stats final. <laughs> so, um, let's see, where's all my tools here? Research in my lab is focused on investigating the role of duplicate Hox genes in the evolution and development of body plan diversity in vertebrates. And most vertebrates, most vertebrates are fishes. So uh, we study a variety of taxa with interesting body plan features and novel reproductive strategies, including all those shown here. So for today's talk, I'm gonna sort of divide it up into two parts. The second part, I'm gonna tell you a story of an incredible reproductive strategy in the surf perches, the MBO today. But for the first part of the talk, I'm going to focus on these three taxa, and I'm going to tell you some stories. Well, this is the um, American paddlefish. This is an ancestral raffin fish. This is the zebrafish. This is an ancestral teleos. And this is the blue banded goby that Scott and his lab work on um, down at Catalina. And this is a representative of a derived teleos. And I'm going to tell you some stories about Hox D and Hox A expression in a variety of novel body plan features which reveal an ancient origin for what is known as the reverse collinear Hox expression pattern. So the paradox of Bevo Devo is that if a diversity of species share homologous genes, then how does diversity arise? The short answer to this is changes in gene expression patterns. Um, that could be changes in the timing, the duration, or place. It could also mean changes in coding sequences, or changes in the number or combination of genes in a particular path or network. So we're just beginning to um, understand the genetic basis of adaptation, but several of the well-described systems describe trait loss or trait reduction. For example, there's a famous story about the evolution, actual selection for armor loss in three-spined three stickleback, 
And there's another famous story about the evolution of eyelessness in Mexican cave fish. But what we'd really like to understand is how and when novel characters arise in evolution. So um, I'm going to share with you a story about functional divergence between Hawks A13 paralogs and zebrafish and their relatives to give you an example of what kind of interesting things happen when duplicate genes are retained in a lineage, like zebrafish and their relatives. So I'm showing you here a gene tree of the Hawks A13 gene, one of my favorite genes. So here you can see zebrafish, and these are their very close relatives. And these are the, in red I'm showing you the Hawks A13A paralogs, and in blue I'm showing you the Hawks A13B paralogs. And I have some appropriate outgroups here. So the first thing that jumps out at you is that the Hawks A13A paralogs, these branch lengths, which are, correspond to the number of substitutions in evolution, are three times longer than the B paralogs. And that's actually quite remarkable because the age of these genes is identical because they originated at a single whole genome duplication event approximately 230 million years ago. So something's going on in these A paralogs in zebrafish and their relatives, <coughs> yet both of these genes have been retained. So to figure this out and test these genes functionally, we were able to knock down um, individual genes one at a time. So um, here we in injected a sham into um, these uh, two cell stage embryos, and we raised them up, and you can see that during normal zebrafish development, there's a feature here called yolk sac extension. Um, and when we knock down the Hox A13B paralog, the yolk sac extension continues to develop. But when we knock down the Hox A13A paralog, the yolk sac extension fails to develop. And I forgot to mention that this is a, a normal feature in um, zebrafish and their relatives, and only zebrafish and their relatives. This is a novel feature associated with saprinoforms. And so I think that I've shown you then functionally, we were also able to um, rescue these phenotypes with rescue constructs, which indicates that the Hox A13A paralog and not the B paralog is associated with a novel trait gain in saprinoforms. So let's back up a minute and um, let me explain to you why Hox genes are known as body plan genes or diversity genes. <clears throat> Hox genes have been widely implicated in playing a key role in the evolution of diversity and complexity because of their role in specifying axial patterning, positional identities, and novel features like the one I just showed you. Hox genes encode transcription factors, which contain a homeobox DNA binding domain. That's how they get their name, the HOX. Um, the genes occur in clusters on the chromosome, which is fairly unusual. And they specify axial patterning, organ placement, and fin and limb development. So for example, here are some expression patterns of some of my favorite genes, Hoxa 11 in pink and Hoxa 13 in blue, in fins, here in paddlefish and zebrafish, and in limbs, as shown here by the chick. Note the, uh, really simil the similarities in expression in early paddlefish development versus late chick development. So the Hox gene family has expanded by and through both tandem and whole genome duplication. So for example, here's a Hox cluster from a representative invertebrate. Here's a fruit fly larvae and their single Hox cluster. And here are the four Hox clusters that occur in all vertebrates that have arisen through two rounds of whole genome duplication. One that occurred before the origin of vertebrates and another that occurred before the origin of jawed vertebrates. And these are referred to as the Hox A cluster, the Hox B, Hox C and the Hox D. Um, the interesting thing about these Hox genes is that they exhibit what's called collinear expression. And that means that the order in which they occur on the chromosome is the order in which they are expressed in the organism. And this is referred to as the general Hox strategy or the Hox code because it's, and it's associated with specification of segment identity. So for an example, this is during the early development of uh, a typical vertebrate. There are these distinct regions called pharyngeal arches. Here we have pharyngeal arch one, and here's two, three, and four, and they're each specified by a unique Hox code as shown here in pink. Pharyngeal arch one is referred to as the Hox free zone, and there can be no Hox expression here during early development or the jaw will fail to develop normally. But each one of these subsequent pharyngeal arches has their own unique um, Hox expression pattern that is, consists of these overlapping and nested Hox expression patterns. Later in development, after the AP axis is set up, we see these posterior um, Hox A and Hox D genes are expressed in fins and limbs, as shown here in green. And these genes are referred to as the Hox limb building toolkit. 
So to give you an example of this collinear expression, um, this is uh, later in development after the AP axis has been set up. We're now looking at Hox expression in a mouse limb. And, um, and the early limb bud, we see this collinear expression where Hox D10 has a broad expression domain and Hox D11, 12, and 13 have increasingly smaller expression domains. And so this is the classic collinear Hox expression. But the interesting thing is that later in development, during specification of these distal features in the mouse limb, this pattern is inverted. So here we see a broader expression of Hox D13, the higher number, relative to its neighboring genes on the cluster. So why would anyone care about this special expression pattern that I'm telling you, this inverse collinear Hox expression pattern? And the answer is, is that it's associated with the absolute most famous tetrapod innovation and well-studied of all time, and that is specification of the digits. And so you can see that this inverse collinear Hox expression pattern where Hox D13 has a broader expression domain relative to the other genes on, neighboring genes on the cluster, lets the thumb and all the tool making abilities that come with it um, evolve differently. Well, this expression pattern was thought to be a tetrapod innovation for years until it was found. Here's that same expression pattern in a tetrapod, um, that hand or called the autopod. Um, it also occurs in the pectoral fins of paddlefish. And so that's quite interesting. And so um, along the way, through about 10 years of publication, this special expression pattern has been referred to by a variety of names. But I'm going to refer to it as distal phase expression, the special inverted collinear expression pattern. Here are the data for paddlefish. This is in the early fin bud. You can see this collinear expression where broader expression domain of D11 compared to D12 and D13. But later, during specification of the distal elements of the fin, there's an inversion of this pattern where Hox D13 has a broader expression domain relative to D12 and D11. Well, if paddlefish doesn't have a thumb, keep in mind that the pectoral fin is asymmetric. And so this is completely consistent with the Hox code setting up an address system to specify anterior, posterior, or proximal distal. Well, it was later found that this expression pattern also occurs in the pectoral fins and pelvic fins of sharks, so an ancestral jawed vertebrate. So here you can see uh, with these Hox D genes, uh, early collinear expression where Hox D13 has a smaller expression domain relative to D12, but later Hox D13 expands far anterior and has a broader expression domain than Hox D12. So with documentation of this special expression pattern in all three lineages of jawed vertebrates, recent research has um, switched to looking at trying to understand the regulation of these expression patterns. And so here, um, it turns out that these expression patterns are regulated independently. There have been a series of papers that came out in the last two years which are really exciting. What I'm showing you here is a heat map. Here's the Hox D cluster and all those genes. And this is a heat map of enhancer promoter interactions. And it turns out that during early development of the proximal features, the majority of interactions are on the three prime side of the Hox D cluster. But there's a conformational switch or topological switch in the chromatin where later in development during specification of these distal features, the majority of contacts are on the other end of the Hox cluster. So I think I've shown you that um, these posterior Hox D genes and these special nested and overlapping expression patterns are associated with um, proximal distal axes and fins and limbs. This is a juvenile paddlefish. And can anyone see a, a fairly conspicuous um, distally elongated structure in this animal? <laughs> so it was, an, it was kind of obvious. My lab became interested in, in understanding whether the Hox limb building toolkit might be redeployed in other body plan appendages or adornments, like the paddlefish rostrum, which takes up about half the standard length of the adult. So the thing about the paddlefish rostrum is that it develops late. So here I'm showing just as paddlefish uh, get older, they get bigger, except for this weird area where they shrink because due to flexion of the caudal fin where they grow in girth and the total length and changes. Um, at any rate, each one of these yellow, uh, red arrows shows, I'm showing you a picture of paddlefish development. And so you can see that the pectoral fin where previous studies have been done occur approximately here, but the rostrum doesn't start elongating until much later. And so, you know, this is a, a time period where no one has really looked at Hox expression. <clears throat> so what we did was we dissected off the rostrum of these uh, paddlefish just at the beginning of rostrum elongation and sequenced the transcriptome. So because we're interested in novel features, we work on a variety of, of non-model taxa that don't have uh, 
genomic resources, which makes annotation of a transcriptome problematic. So fortunately, I had previously sequenced the whole HOXA and HOXD clusters from bat clones in paddlefish. So I had the exact sequences. So what I did was I sequenced the transcriptome in the rostrum, got sequences of all the genes that are being expressed during rostrum elongation, and I set up a local BLAST server, and I took the known sequences and queried my transcriptome data. And I asked, is this gene of interest? So I was able to use this modified candidate gene approach, which is a little easier, um, and doesn't require genome assembly. I was able to ask, this, is this exact, exact gene present in the rostrum transcriptome? Um, and so I was able to put together a list of genes that are expressed in the rostrum during development, and we later verified um, expression of these genes using in situ hybridization. So here's the list of those genes from the Hox limb and fin building toolkit. We found no evidence for expression of Hox A13, but we did find evidence for expression of Hox A11, Hox D13, Hox D12, and Hox D11 in the paddlefish rostrum. So this was really exciting. The toolkit's being being redeployed somewhere, um, and so. It was incredibly frustrating that after three years of in situ hybridization, we found no expression of any of these genes in the rostrum. So you might be wondering, why were they in the transcriptome? And the answer is, every one of the genes on the list was expressed in the paddlefish barbel, which was part of our transcriptome. You can see they occur anterior to the upper lip in, in exactly the uh, semi-quantitative way that transcriptomes work. So it turned out to be really interesting, not at all what we expected. And it turned out to have some pretty interesting um, patterns. So here I'm showing you a paddlefish barbel. It has a cartilaginous core. Um, it is a derivative of pharyngeal arch one. So this was the first evidence of any Hox expression in uh, a derivative of pharyngeal arch one, which is formerly known as the Hox freezon. But keep in mind that the barbel developed much later than the jaw. So using this toolkit at different times in different places um, turns out to be associated with all kinds of novel features. Just like our transcriptome indicated, we found no evidence for expression of HOXA13, some evidence for HOXA11, but there was no overlapping story here for this collinear or reverse collinear. But we saw an interesting pattern with the HOXD gene, where for the first time, we found that the expression of HOXD13 had a, a broader expression domain relative to HOXD12. And this is consistent with this distal phase HOX expression pattern. So not only did we find the first evidence of HOX genes being expressed in a derivative of pharyngeal arch one, it also indicates that this distal phase Hoxie expression is not restricted to fins and limbs. So with documentation, oh, I think that, sorry, lost my place for a second. The interesting thing, this is the same heat map, where I'm showing you a heat map of these enhancer promoter interactions. This is the slide I showed you before, um, where you see the majority of regulatory contacts during specification of pro proximal features is on the three prime end of the cluster. HOXD. During specification of the distal features, the majority of contacts are on the five prime end of the cluster. The interesting thing is this paper came out last year. The same pattern occurs with the HOXA cluster in both mice and zebrafish. So this actually predicts that we should see distal phase expression of the HOXA genes. But so far, this has not been observed in fins or limbs or any other feature until now. So when we were doing this in C2 hybridization on barbel, we were looking at whole mounts of embryos, and we found an interesting Hox A expression pattern in the vent of paddlefish. So for all these slides, we did millions of in situs. I'm just showing you like when maximum expression occurs. But you can clearly see that Hox A11 is restricted to the distal tip of the vent, and Hox A13 has a broader expression domain, which is consistent with this distal phase Hox A expression. So we were so interested in this pattern in, in um, paddlefish that we wanted to see if it extends to other ray fin fishes. So we looked for this pattern in zebrafish, and sure enough, we found distal phase hoxa expression in the vent. Uh, this is that yolk sac extension. I already talked about hoxa 13 in the yolk sac extension. In the hindgut and the vent, and you can see that hox A13A has a broader expression domain and spans more somites than hox A11A. We found a similar pattern much later in development during specification of this distal region of the vent. And when we looked at a derived telias, the blue banded goby, we found a really interesting expression pattern of these HOXA genes, again, with the broader expression pattern of HOXA 13A relative to HOXA 11. So when we put this together, I've shown you that we have this distal phase HOXD expression pattern, which was formerly only associated with specification of the thumb and then later uh, in limbs and fins. 
also occurs in the barbel of paddlefish. And I've shown you the first evidence for this distal phase expression pattern of the Hawks A gene in the vent of three ray fin fishes. So I have a current graduate student who's looking at these Hawks A genes, because now they're um, on our radar as a very interesting group of genes. And um, these are the Hawks D genes. A paper came out last year. We actually had done the Hawks D genes, but these guys published it first. Um, we're, we're looking at, these are the uh, pelvic fins of a male skate. And this is a sexually dimorphic character. Here you see um, the little skate. Here's a female. These are the pe pelvic fins. Here's a male. They have these elongated claspers. Um, and so we wanted to look at, are these pelvic fins, fin genes recapitulated during development of the claspers? And again, no one had really done this before because the claspers developed late. And so um, the Cone Lab showed that there's collinear Hox D expression during development of the claspers. But my graduate student, Shannon Berry, has also shown that this interesting pattern with the Hox A gene, where we have this broader expression domain of Hox A13 relative to Hox A11. <coughs> And so it's currently debated in the literature whether claspers are a modified pelvic fin or if they're uh, an independent third uh, paired appendage. Um, so that would be interesting to, to think about these Hox genes being deployed in, in all kinds of things. So I think I've shown you that this distal phase Hox D expression pattern is not restricted to fins and limbs, but occurs in a variety of novel features such as the paddlefish barbel. And I've shown you the first evidence for distal phase Hox A expression in the hindgut and vent of three rapin fishes and in the claspers of cartilaginous fishes. And this expression pattern was actually predicted by the shared chromatin architecture of the regulatory regions between the Hox A and Hox D clusters. So this is one of the few cases where the regulatory regions were found before the actual expression pattern. So if we put this together, each one of these features that occur, this could be a fin or a limb. Here we have the vent and here's a barbel. Each one of these has a proximal and a distal region. They each have their own unique Hox code. So when we combine these, Hox A, here's the, the uh, overlapping gene expression pattern. Every one of these is different in their proximal and distal, and every one of these features that co-occur in a paddlefish is different from each other. But there's no reason to think that um, these expression patterns can't be recapitulated in under other lineages with distinct phenotypes. So it may be that um, independent regulation of multiple inputs, with these Hox A and D genes, um, simply expands the combinatorial power of the Hox code to um, specify distinct features. So I think I've shown you that there may be more to the Hox code than was previously appreciated even uh, a few years ago. Um, and I think we're going to have to do away with phrases such as the general Hox strategy or the fin and limb building toolkit, because I would argue we're just beginning to scratch the surface of um, the variety of ways that the Hox code can be deployed in a variety of features that have yet to be looked at. So research in my lab is now turning to looking at questions like how the devil ray got its horns, how the seahorse and pikefish got a brood pouch to support male pregnancy, and how the surf perch got a modified anal fin to facilitate internal fertilization. So with the first part of this uh, talk, I'd like to acknowledge the students that did the work. Sophie Arjambeau did the work on zebrafish and gobies. Julia Taylor did the work on paddlefish. And Shannon Berry did the work on the little skate and thanks to our collaborators on various aspects and publications that came out of this. So the second half of the talk's a little bit of a different story, so I thought I would pause here to see if there's any questions about this Hawk story. And we're well ahead of schedule, so. Okay. <laughs> any, any questions about Hawk's expression? So you could ask at the end also. All right. So let's jump into the next part of the talk, um, where I'd like to uh, share a story with you about multiple paternity as a shared reproductive strategy in the live bearing surf perches. Here we have a striped surf perch right here, giving birth, um, that may be associated with female bait ingredients, <coughs> cryptic female choice, and sexual selection. So Bateman's principles are considered the cornerstone of modern sexual selection theory. Based on the observations, that males have a higher variance in both number of mates and number of offspring relative to females. And this is manifest in a positive correlation or a steeper slope between mating success or number of mates and reproductive success or number of offspring in males but not females. This sets the expectation for male-to-male -male competition 
and female sexual selection on males that should result in choosing females selecting few males. And while these principles have uh, been scrutinized for decades, the observation remains true for a large number of animals with conventional sex roles, and the opposite pattern is even true for um, sex role reversed animals like the seahorse and the pipefish, where in this case the male bears the burden of uh, reproduction and the female has the steeper bait gradient. Well, let me introduce you to a family of fishes that does the unexpected. These are the fabulous surf perches where female abatement gradients may be the norm. And there may be additional ways that females uh, influence aspects of the reproductive biology. So I like to argue that surf perches have the most derived reproductive system of all vertebrates. Uh, most fishes are broadcast spawners, so egg and sperm get released into the water and um, go on their merry way. Uh, however, surf perches give birth to small broods of live young, which is a little bit unusual in the fish world fish world, but what's really remarkable is that when they're born, they're sexually mature. So in the case of surf perches, they basically give birth to teenagers. So this is the ultimate in, in fitness, right? You have instant fitness if your offspring can reproduce the day they're born. So I know, if you think about it, it's a fairly, uh, at least we can call it a derived reproductive strategy, right? So females then because they bear such a huge burden for reproduction, they should be uh, very choosy and select few mates. But that's not what we've seen in nature. For example, in this brood of 13, there are at least six different sires, or fathers. So that was the spot fin surf perch. We looked at 24 families of spot fin surf perch, and this is the allocation of paternity. And we found multiple paternity in 100% of the families that we looked at. When we look at this in a phylogenetic context, this is a very recent phylogeny put out by Longo and Bernardi. The first thing you can see is that the family um, of surf perches is split into two um, subfamilies. Here we have the Amphistichini, and here we have the Embiotocini. Um, it looks like there have been several studies on multiple paternity, and it looks like it's a general feature of the family. So um, Bernardi and colleagues have looked at the genus Embiotoca. Lou and Avis have um, documented multiple paternity in this clade of the embiotocene, and I just showed you data for the spot fin surf perch, the ancestral amphistocene. All, in all these studies, multiple paternity was inferred using microsatellites, where each individual has two alleles. Here we have this little cartoon of a mom, a small family with a mom, one offspring, and a dad. You can see these are mom's two alleles, and this offspring got this allele from mom, it got this allele from dad, and within this small family at this one locus, there are four alleles present. So I call this the CAG-15 locus. And here I'm showing you allelic diversity. These are the sizes of these fragments for the CAG-15 locus for the blue species. In this case, it's two populations, the northern and southern population. And so it turns out that as long as you have multiple loci with a, a sufficient amount of variation, you can infer multiple paternity with these microsatellites. But the problem is, as you can see, is that some microsatellite loci are more informative than others, and they vary greatly between species. Nonetheless, when we looked at our data for spot fin surf perch, among all these studies, ours was the first to show this female Bateman gradient, which is not what you expect. Normally, you expect this positive correlation in males, not females, especially when females bear the burden of reproduction. And there's no other organism, no vertebrate bears the burden of reproduction like a female surf perch. So we were the first ones to show this um, female Bateman gradient. Here we have number of sires versus um, number of offspring. And in addition, when we looked at Shiner surf perch, with our data set alone, we weren't able to infer a female Bateman gradient. But when we combined it with the Lou and Avis data, the southern species, we were able to infer a positive Bateman gradient in the Shiner surf perch also. So when we map these female Bateman gradients back on the phylogeny, we have at least one member from each of these subfamilies that have this positive correlation between reproductive success and um, mating success. So this led us to uh, become curious about the following three questions. One is, do surf perches exhibit cryptic female choice? Um, two, are there differences in reproductive strategies and female Bateman gradients between the two subfamilies, the amphistichini and the embiotocene? And finally, is there a difference between male and female Bateman gradients in surf perches? So, to answer this first question, or to think about it at least, do female surf perches exhibit cryptic female choice? 
I can't think of a single other taxon of fishes that has more opportunity for cryptic female choice. So in other, remember that having a positive Bateman gradient means that females are benefiting. They're having a larger brood size associated with acquiring more mates. Um, so if we think about the um, reproductive cycle of the Shiner surf perch shown here, um, females are reproductive all year, so there is no reproductive season. But there is a mating season, and that's shown in blue right here, or blue and purple. This is when sperm is present in males. So um, we can track that by measuring GSI, or gonadosomal index, in males. <clears throat> and so that remains high during these months, um, July, August, September. And then male GSI goes to zero. But the interesting, so that means mating's over. The interesting thing is that females continue to produce class three oocytes for several months until at some point, so females are baiting, they're storing sperm, they're continuing to produce mature oocytes until at some point fertilization occurs and it's synchronized because in almost every family we look at, the size of the offspring are remarkably similar at a similar stage in development. They only vary by a few millimeters. And then they gestate for several months until they give birth and the cycle starts again. So this, this idea that the number of mates is set before the number, the brood size is set, is consistent with the true Bateman gradient. In addition, the oocytes have a relatively small amount of yolk. And so these offspring, um, this is a picture of the uterine sac, and it's incredibly complex in surf perches. There are three main pockets, but the, the pockets have dividers in between them and so on, and the offspring are all throughout here. The yolk has gone relatively early, and so the offspring, um, develop based on this uterine milk that's supplied by the mom. So there's all kinds of opportunities in this complex uterine sac for um, differential allocation of nutrients, differential allocation of sperm, sperm competition, and then differential paternity that the female may have some influence over. And so this is just a, a, a preserved uterine sac, and you can see how these large uh, juveniles are about to emerge out of here. They're packed in there. You can't believe it, when we fish these guys on the pier, We'll get a little spot bin this big, and we'll start pulling out like 12 to 18 babies, and like little kids run up to us. You, you can't believe that this many babies this big come out of that, that pregnant mom. Um, finally, while not common, we have uh, had seen two examples of a female being having the ability to abandon a brood. So in this case, you can see that this female is ditching this brood. There are all these uh, offspring at various stages of resorption, and some more than others, and so on. So these are just a, a variety of ways that females have the opportunity to exhibit cryptic female choice. So then we became interested in trying to ask whether there are differences in reproductive strategies and the slope of female bait migrators between the two subfamilies. So it turns out that we, we don't have nearly enough resolution to answer this question with microsatellites. So we've turned to, uh, we want to be able to, asset, to access genomic variation. And so we'll do that in order to increase the accuracy of assigning paternity and inference of Bateman gradients using this um, procedure called RADSEQ, which stands for Restricted Site Associated DNA Sequencing. And so what we do is we chop up genomic DNA with a restriction enzyme and we sequence the following 80 to 150 base pairs. And because they all have that similar start site, we're able to make these alignments for, that are randomly distributed throughout the, ge the genome. And we look in those sequence then for what are called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And this results in, it, my slide says thousands, but it's actually tens of thousands of variant loci. So we're able to infer paternity with a high degree of accuracy. So to demonstrate the power of this technique, these are the data for spot fin surf perch that I showed you earlier. There's a positive correlation <clears throat> in this female Bateman gradient. Uh, based on microsatellite loci. This was based on, I think, four or five loci. We resampled eight of these families and did use this sequence rad tags or use this rad seek approach. And we were able to uh, infer a steeper female Bateman gradient. Notice that the brood size stays the same, of course, because we're sampling the same family, but the number of sires that we inferred jumps from two to three all the way up to six. And notice that the R squared jumps up to 0.96. So using this technique, We'd like to be able to um, look at not only um, the presence of female Bateman gradients between these two subfamilies, but compare the slopes. And there are other reasons why we think there might be differences between these two subfamilies as well. First of all, the two subfamilies occur in different habitats. And all surf perches exhibit the sexual dimorphism in, in modified anal fins. 
And it, but it's different between the two subfamilies that we think may be associated with the environment in which they occur. So the amphisichony, as shown here, here's a male and here's a female. The males have this um, structure, mid-anal fin, where there's a notch, and they've, there's a structure that's been described in the literature, old literature, as having hooks and bars. And this is the subfamily that occurs in a surfy turfy environment with lots of turbulence and physical motion. Um, whereas the other subfamily, the Ebiotocinae, has a structure at the anterior part of the anal fin, which has been referred to as a fleshy protuberance. And this is where the talk's going to start to get a little racy. Um, <clears throat> so these are some anal fins of the first subfamily, the Amphisichony. Um, this is just a close-up. It, it looks like there's a hook or something, but there's this notch mid-anal fin. These are the males. Did I show you that the female didn't have it? No. Sorry. See, the female doesn't have it. Um, these are males of the amphisichony. These are some um, sort of clear and stain preparations by an undergraduate in my lab. And it turns out that while it might look like there's a little hook or something there, this is all fleshy business. But there is a bony um, modification here where there are four to eight fin rays that are fused together. So there's this triangular bony plate right here. And you can't see it that well, but there's the um, uh, fin ray that's right next to it is also modified. And these are two different species where you can see this bony plate. Um, believe me, we're just trying to figure out the basics of reproductive biology here. We're trying to figure out what happens with these anal fins. And we've tried all kinds of things with tissue paper and things, and it, it looks like this bony plate, there's like a little mold, there's a toothy edge to it, and there's the, the fin ray next to it. It also has like this puzzle piece, and it seems like they might connect anal fins, just grab onto each other. And by the way, in these males, this is nowhere near where sperm comes out. In the embryotocene, there's uh, some kind of, this is the fleshy protuberance at the anterior part of the anal fin. Here's a male, here's a female that's lacking it. And in this video by Gary Longo, please work, there we go. You can see more uh, in more detail what's going on with this fleshy protuberance. nowhere near where sperm comes out. There, so when you press on this like little fleshy bag, there's this little tubercle that we've actually injected seawater into this little squirt bag, and sure enough, water squirts anterior towards the region where sperm does come out. But I mean, this is like an incredible uh, evolutionary novelty. I'd really like to know what's going on just mechanically. And also, um, I didn't show you my data, but uh, all those interesting hox genes are also expressed in anal fins, and I'd really be interested to see if there's an interesting expression pattern in the surf perches. That's another whole story. Um, so the last thing I'd like to think about is, is there a difference between uh, female and male Bateman gradients in surf perches? I've described the reproductive system. There's no way I think we'll ever, unless we do, do captive experiments, you'd never be able to um, demonstrate in the wild um, how many offspring a male might fertilize because there's this mating season and they don't even get fertilized until months later. But what I can tell you is that there's a positive correlation between female standard length and brood size for all surf perches. And this is a general observation that's true for most fishes. I can't think of a single fish where it isn't true. Um, and here's two species, the, the blue species, which are shiner surf perch, and the red species, which are boffin surf perch. And so just looking at this implies that male surf perches are likely targeting large females while continuing to maximize multiple mates. So I think I've shown you that Surf perches don't have the situation with this conventional sex role where the male benefits from multiple partners but the female doesn't. I've already shown you data where the females do benefit from multiple partners. So that's not what's going on. They definitely don't have the sex role reversal like the seahorses and pipe fishes because in this case, females are bearing an enormous burden of reproduction, yet they are benefiting from having multiple mates. <clears throat> so um, this led us to think that females may have more control over their reproduction than than might uh, meet the eye. And then there's lots of opportunities for cryptic female choice. I've showed you that brood size is set after the number of mates is determined. The uterine sac is incredibly complex with potential for differential sperm allocation, embryonic nutrition, and sperm competition. And that females have the ability to abandon a brood. And that it makes sense that males likely compete for large females and multiple mates. So we probably have a situation where there's strong sexual selection in both sexes in this family. And so now what I'd like to do is my current NSF proposal is to try to get funding to look at the strength of this relationship between species and subfamilies using this rad approach.
So I'd like to acknowledge the students that did this work. This is a current um, graduate student in my lab, Michael Izumiyama. He started off as an undergrad. This is him in Japan he, uh, on Sato Island last October. He paid for it. I was going there. I got invited to give a talk. He showed up on his own dime, caught a bunch of Japanese surf perch, and he's already like taken off. And so he just started his grad pro pro program a couple months ago, but he's already got lots of really interesting stories. This was an undergraduate in my lab. He's the first author on that Bateman gradient paper. And then this is a graduate student, Sophie Argembeau. She's been incredibly prolific. She's in a PhD program at University of Washington right now. And she and I have four publications together. Um, and so then I'd also like to thank Team Surf Perch. Um, our collaborators are Giacomo Bernardi, Michael Westfall, and Steve Mori, and the rest of Team Surf Perch. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions about surf perch anal fins. <laughs> or anything else. Carrie? Is the sperm from the multiple males stored in the same place? So the multiple you know, sources that are all mixed together? Or are they separated? That's what I would really like to know. There's lots of animals that have a, what's called the spermatotheca or some kind of like little sperm packet. We know they're storing sperm for some number of months. Um, one of the things, Michael, he's going to go back to Japan this summer, uh, and our, my colleague there is a, has a histology lab, so we're going to just section the uterine sac and s try to see where the sperm is being stored. There's a reference from like 1938 that's like, yeah, they store, they store sperm separately from multiple males, but there's not a shred of evidence saying where and how or whatever. So we're actually just basic questions trying to figure that out. Um, in addition to that, we're going to uh, try to take the... Um, after male GSI goes to zero, so mating's over, we're gonna try to take these uterine sacs. There's no way to follow this through time as an individual, but look at how many sperm donors there are um, after reproductive season is over, and then tr like in 10 females or 20, then look a little bit later on, and then later at parturition, how many males actually got paternity to try to address this question of, are females ditching the, you know, are some males losing out, some mates losing out on paternity? That's the only way I can think of to demonstrate this um, cryptic female choice, but it'd be really interesting if we find a difference. You know, there's lots of evidence for this in bugs and all kinds of, of animals where females do select mates. Um, and there's all kinds of things that they can sense and see. And, you know, there's a variety of senses. But I have a wild hypothesis for which I have no data that I, and that I think that it's possible that females are using sperm from multiple partners as nutrition. They're all stored in the same place. There's this uterine milk. It's costly. You know, there's, there's lots of... Uh, Examples of sperm that has a high sugar content and calories. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea how I would begin to address that, but it, it, it's not implausible. <laughs> Donna? I'm just thinking there must be an optimal brood size, like you have number of mates, and then like a, it, it could go on the, the brood size, that's reproductive success. Right. But then do those little babies change size the more that there are? And do they, uh, do they live as long? You know, do they go on to survive right. if they aren't as big it, at birth? I have no idea. So there's a little bit of evidence that larger females have larger offspring at parturition, but by tiny amounts, by millimeters. So there's but the brood size is larger. So what females are doing as they're getting larger is they're having more offspring. Not smaller babies? I mean, slightly tiny, oh. tiny bit bigger, but only in a matter of millimeters. But we're talking, I mean, these things are already like uh, 60 millimeters, so the difference between 60 and 62 doesn't seem great to me. Um, and then, so, but females are using that increased size to have a larger brood. But keep in mind that if, if they get, if a female becomes a grandmother, as soon as she gives birth, fitness has already been paid. The, the currency of evolution has already been paid out. So they don't even have to survive that long, and I have no idea how long they do survive, except for we do catch young of the year off the Pacific up here all the time, and we can kind of track for spot fins and shiners, uh, sort of how much they grow, we, and, and we get one-year-olds, yeah. Do you mean that those little females have babies? They mate, and they have little tiny babies? Well, it, I, I generalize. There's only one species that is known for, it's the dwarf surf perch, and it's the males that are sexually mature, at birth, okay. not the females, and that's so that they don't uh, fertilize their siblings. So they give birth, the males can fertilize anyone right now, but the females aren't ready for another couple of months. <laughs> Only in Tennessee. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I'm pulling way back to my first quarter at UCSD, but I remember learning about infants where, like, if it behooves you to have, like, really kind of, like, alpha, bulky sons, but maybe more, like, severe, discreet daughters, they'll actually pick males that were actually smaller and use that sperm to fertilize females and use bigger, like, male sperm to fertilize. No, I haven't at all. In fact, we looked for um, differential allocation.
allocation of paternity in those three sacks, and we didn't have the power to detect it. We didn't find a pattern, although there was like this non-significant thing where the pouch on the left always had fewer offspring and fewer fathers because it wasn't significant, but then we realized we didn't have the power to detect it if it were manifest. This was the minor Right, right. And sex determination is wildly variable in fishes. Yeah. I don't know how it's done in, in surf bridges. Yes? I was going to ask a question about the Hox gene stuff. Yeah. And so there's a lot of fish species that have very elaborate dorsal fin spines, and maybe they're present during their larval phase and not the adult phase, or maybe it's the adult phase and not the larval phase. Are, right. are Hox genes and the different expression of those involved in, in those sort of processes, or is it restricted to more of the other fins and things? They're definitely expressed in both medial and paired fins, especially during the um, onset and early development of these fins. No one's looked at all these structures later on. What I can tell you is that Hox genes are in a pathway. You know, I didn't show this complicated pathway of Hox genes because, and no one does. Like you, you see all these pathways for all these other gene regulatory networks for pigmentation and all other, that's the most complicated one I know, except for all the prep cycle stuff. But that's more like basic cell machinery. But you never see one for Hox genes because from scouring the literature for a decade, what I can tell you is that, I don't know if you're familiar with any of these genes, that retinoic acid is upstream of Hox D. Sonic Hedgehog is both upstream and downstream of Hox D. And what's downstream of all that are these elongation factors called FGFs. Um, and uh, went three, and there's a whole family of FGFs. So um, FGFs, like for example, if you look at the digits in a, um, uh, a whale or a dolphin, how do you get these digit three and four to be longer? You just leave FGF on longer, and you'll get more elements and a longer uh, element in those digits. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if FGFs play a role in these dorsal fin morphology. And I showed a picture of a lionfish up here, because we started off thinking this would be cool to look at a lionfish, but then our Sophie's path went all over the place, and so we ended up finding other interesting things that took up all of our time. Um, so hop genes are in the pathway of FGFs, uh, but that's the interesting thing. There's a cassette that's associated with the evolution of novelty, but there's no reason in the world to think that evolution only has a single playbook. So um, th I'd like to understand when is this cassette utilized, how and when and where. And the one thing that I left out is that these Hox D genes are definitely patterning cattlefish barbels, but we looked in zebrafish barbels. Zebrafish have two pairs of barbels, and they are not expressed in zebrafish barbels, which is entirely consistent with the multiple independent origins of barbels in the tree of rape and fishes. So there's multiple ways to build a marble. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Carol? Say that three times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. It was, it's a You're pleasure. Sure. I had some slides on my career path. I don't know if the students at Moss Landing are interested. It actually looks like we're close to five. And they've pretty much read all of it. Um, anyway, I'm a product of the CSU system. As Dave said, I did my undergraduate degree at Cal State Northridge. I did, uh, then I was a teacher. I did a master's degree at Moss Landing through San Francisco State, where Ralph Larson was my advisor. And um, then I did a PhD at UC Santa Cruz. Did a couple internships at Georgia and University of Florida in between, and just wanted to like find out all these interesting things about fishes. Um, uh, during my time at Santa Cruz, I, I continued on my work that I started at Moss Landing with this family of fishes called the Hexagrammets. Um, I'll show my video here. They asked me to show a, a cool video from Stillwater Coves. So this is my career path. I did all these interesting things. Traveled around the world. Never made a bunch of money, but I did travel around the world. <laughs> so uh, I started working on Kelp Greenland. This is a video shot by a former dive safety officer at Moss Landing by John Heine. Um, this is a male and female. I, I should say that this is a this is a sexually explicit video. <laughs> this is a male fertilizing. There's the female in yellow. They're sexually dimorphic. This is a kelp greenling. This is a stillwater cove. This is a male that's fertilizing those guys. And so the greenling have really interesting reproductive um, characteristics, like male parental care, um, sneak spawning, which was something I was thinking about when you were talking. Um, and they also have hybridization. So I was looking at multiple maternity in the nests of these males. So see, the female swims off, the male's going to stay and guard those eggs. Um, males have like anywhere from two to eight clutches that they guard in, in an area that's like one to two square meters. Oops. And anyway, there's this really interesting story. I may as well just tell you. So then when I did my PhD, I got interested in this. And so I looked at, I did a phylogeny of this family. 
And it turns out that there are six species in the genus, and they have a, um, a phylogeographic distribution along the longitudinal gradient, which means that the ancestral ones are located in the eastern Pacific and the derived ones are in the western Pacific. But while I was sampling at all those locations with black dots, I noticed a large number of hybrids at this place where these, two, these three species overlap. And it was a really interesting pattern because the two species that are more closely related, the Otaki and Agramus, there was not a single hybrid between those guys, but there were lots of hybrids between um, Otaki and Octogramus and Agramus and Octogramus. And so by looking at this a number of ways, I was able to infer sympatric speciation because based on the observation that reproductive isolation had built up faster between closest relatives had, that have not been divergent for as long, and it was still lagging behind in um, these uh, more distant relatives. <laughs> <laughs> eventually, this, eventually, this made the cover of molecular ecology like six years later, so my advice to you is stick with it. And here's some fun antics at Moss Landing Marine Lab. Oh. There's a stinking oh. hilarious, some of these people are in the audience, there's a hilarious story that goes with this, but I prefer if you bug die about it or something to build up the urban legend aspect of this. <laughs> so that's, that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs>